a company is producing products with a specific weight every day they take a sample of three products the question is is this process in control okay so what does that mean if a process is in control uh, so let's say if if this is our uh, let's say this is y axis and this is x axis x axis is time and y axis is our measurement uh, if the the process is in control and this is the target let's say they are producing bags of chips 500 gram is the target if the process is in control is it possible that they produce a bag of chips that is more than 500 grams yep is this process that the average of three bags of chips may be less than 500 grams Silence. Silence is an opportunity. Anyone? Yeah, the average can be around there. Is it, uh, the question is this, is it possible that the average of three bags of chips be less than 500? Yes. Yep. Yeah, so it is possible. But if this process is in control, yes, we can have what is called random variation around the target that is expected okay but if we observe that the average of three bags of chips this at time tn is this and at time tn plus one is this and this is happening still it is random variation but then we don't consider this a process that is in control. That is the whole idea of a statistical process control. So these, stat these variations are statistically expected. We, we are not expecting a deterministic world that rotates or randomized around the Artaguchi target. Um, we are realist people. But sometimes these random variations are the result of, you know, a natural variation of the phenomena that cannot be attributed to any specific cause, like the change of temperature, things in the world are not deterministic. But then sometimes at some specific point, from some specific point on, you see a drift in that random variation and this is what we want to, to detect. This is our whole goal. So in this company, every day they are taking a sample of three products, uh, but they want to see if on average, these uh, variations are stable in one word, we can say, uh, or they are, or no, they are drifting and we can identify uh, there is a specific cause at some point leading to the process to, to change. And that change is, cannot be attributed to random variation anymore. And that is how we control our process. If we detect a variation that is not, uh, can be detected that it is not random, then that's the time that we have to shut down the process and do the corrective action. Similar to the uh, situation in a Six Sigma process when there is a mistake and then we, uh, you know, goes out of 4.5 standard deviations and we stop the process to correct it. 
um, similar is here. So notice that in a statistical process control, this chapter 16, everything is out of control limits, not a specification limits. And we are talking about inside the company, the customers are still happy. We draw the control limits based on the variations that are acceptable for us, not for customers. So we are assuming that what we are discussing is still within the expectations of the customer, but we want to do corrective action before any unhappy customer is generated. So if this is weight, just I want to draw your attention because in this chapter, we, have, we will talk about three different statistical process methods or four. Uh, and, and the decision that we make is based on the type of variable that we have. In this case, we have weight. It can be time, it can be length. Uh, these type of variables are continuous variables. And when continuous variables are involved, when we have a sample, we can find their average. So if this is a weight, this is a weight, this is a weight, we can find the weight of the average weight of that sample. Three items are in the sample. We can find the average of the first sample. Then we can compare it with the average of the second sample and so forth. So let's do that. Um, you see, it's very simple. The average of these three cells, and then we copy that formula to all of the future cells. And uh, notice that if you make your column a little smaller, then the decimal points don't show up. If you change your font to a smaller size, or if you increase the widths of your columns, then you will see more decimal points. Um, it doesn't matter. As long as you use the right formula, these numbers are kept in Excel with many, many decimal places. Good. So how about we call this um, X bar? This is the average of a sample. You remember that we use mu for the average of the population and we use X bar in our statistics course as the average of the sample, right? And now we can actually look at uh, the distribution of these um, averages and we may be able to make a judgment. So I go to insert and I generate a chart that shows the variations. Uh, what do you think about this process? Uh, is this in control? Do you think, think that these variations are random or do you think at some point there has has something has happened and a drift is observed starting to drift uh, after which point around like 22 or 23 exactly exactly very good so the whole purpose of a statistical process control methods is to have to create a systematic method of analysis such that i, sh I don't say oh please can you detect or not detect and so forth we want to have a you know, very standardized method that all of the process managers follow and they can communicate and agree with each other about the processes that are in control or not. So it gets rid of your chart now. To reach to that goal, this is what we will do. First, we will find the center line, center line of these X bars. So each one of these points that we presented is the average of a sample that we took. And how many samples we have taken so far? Uh, 30. 30, exactly. So in the past month, they have taken samples and now we are analyzing them. Every day they have taken one sample of three. And now um, we want to find each one of the data points that we have is a... X bar, what is a good name for average of X bars? Average of X bars. How about we call it X bar bar? Uh, you like it or not, this is the way that the book has called it. 
and it's reasonable because it's the average of x bars. So is x bar bar. Okay. So at this these cells, we have to write down the average of those x bars. So we say equals to average of these cells. But notice that the average of these cells, we want um, always to refer to this set of cells. And therefore I press F4 in front of these cells. So we type dollar, 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 and dollar. Because if we copy this formula, we want them to be absolute address, not relative address. And we are actually going to copy these. So the average of those numbers are not going to change. So this, uh, sorry, not here. So this is X bar bar. And so as you can see, yeah. the average of set of numbers is always the same. It's not going to change. So now let's- Professor, and for uh, putting, instead of putting dollar sign, we can also do F, right? Yes, yes. Okay. And now we copy this and we select that and we insert a chart. This should give us a better understanding. So as one of your friends suggested, after point 22, we observe this variations are not random around the center line. All of them are on one side of the center line. So that is the definition of a shift. We have random variations out of the around the green line um, all the time before 22, and suddenly after 22, uh, all of the observations are on one side of that center line, and that's an indication of um, a shift that is not the result of random variation. When this is detected, uh, regardless of the happiness of customer or not, you have to shut down your process. You have to do recalibration, find out what is going, you use the cause and effect chart, just find out what is wrong. And before anything uh, that may make your customer unhappy, you have to detect and prevent this shift to continue. Uh, in, the, in a Six Sigma process, the control limits were at uh, 4.5 standard deviations above the mean. In a system like this, that we are not promis promising any specific level of Sigma, um, and we are just relying on, uh, you know, detecting uh, a shift uh, for the upper control limit and lower control limit in the control department. We have two formulas. Uh, I write it here for you. The, the upper control limit is X bar bar plus a two R bar and the lower control limit is X bar bar minus a two R bar. So if we want to find the upper, um, there is, you will later realize why I'm doing this. If you want to show the upper control limit here and the lower control limit here, uh, we have to find this. We have to go to upper control limit is equal to X bar bar plus, oh, we have to add, uh, we have to find out A2 and R bar. What are those two, okay? A2 is a constant that comes from, again, experience of um, production control. To find out A2, the first column of appendix B is N, and N is the sample size. Can you tell me in this story that we are working on my worksheet, what is the sample size in that production company? Three. Exactly. Don't ever use 30 because if up to today we have taken 
30 samples. Tomorrow we'll take another sample and it would be 31. And the day after that would be 32. So this table is not referring to the number of samples or the number of days you have worked in this company. It is the sample size, which is a constant. And in this case, it is three. So we are looking at row three and very easily we can find A2. So just tell me yeah. A2 and I'm going to type it. One, 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 zero, two, three. Zero, two, three. Is that right? Very good. So now we have to multiply it by the average range. Hmm. What is the average range? We don't know it. Okay. So we have to do, we have to find the range. So here, let's find a range. R. So what is the range of the first sample? Range is the distance. 14. Between Okay, how about, we have to write a formula because we want to, the range of all of these cells. So we write equals to the maximum of these three numbers minus the minimum of those three numbers. Come on. Uh, so maximum minus minimum and we want the range of all of these uh, samples. But does the formula say R or it says R bar? It says R bar. So actually the formula doesn't rely on the range of this sample. It relies on the average, average range. range of all of the samples. So that is called R bar. So let's find R bar. And R bar is the average of all of these ranges. And remember to put this uh, for exactly. Uh, sorry, um, Amir, can I see the uh, the formula for range after you've done what you're, whatever you're doing? I just I, yes. I, I just want to double check. Sure. Uh, yes, thank you. Professor, can you show the R bar formula? <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. And now we can copy our bar because it is needed everywhere. So we now we have the R bar. So let's go back to our upper control limit. So upper control limit was X bar bar plus A2 multiplied by R bar. And R bar is this guy. Good? Yep. Enter. And now this is our upper control limit. We can also do the lower control limit, which is X bar bar minus A2. It was 1.023 multiplied by R bar. And now we can copy this. Um, can you show the formula for UCL? Okay, thank you. My pleasure. And notice that these are related, so what we want, these are all related to X bar. Uh, you know, we found X bar, maybe I, let me, let me give it a color. 
So we have X bar, then we have upper control limit and lower control limit uh, around X bar bar. And actually I want to draw a diagram that presents these findings. So I go to insert and uh, now this process, we have some random variations and fortunately, none of the, these variations are out of the control limits. So from, from the first principle point of view, uh, we are happy that none of these points are out of control limits, but it is not good that the last points are on one side of the center line. So this is not good. And as many of you mentioned, this means that this process is not very much in control. It's actually, there is a shift. Now to detect these kind of shifts, we don't want to argue and tell each other, oh, please accept that there is a shift or not. And these kind of things, you would see there are, um, a number of principles that we have to follow. Uh, it's uh, the title of the page is interpreting patterns in control charts. So this control chart that you are looking at on my screen right now is an example of the control charts that none of the observations are out of control limits. But when we look at the principles for um, analyzing these control charts, we see that uh, maybe you highlight it. The first thing at the top of the page says, no points should be outside control limits. From that point of view, we are happy. But the other principle says that the points should be randomly spread around the center line and so forth. And detecting whether or not these are randomly spread around the center line or not, needs a set of principles. So the first principle says that eight points in a row, if they are above or below the th center line, then we detect a shift. If 10 out of 11 consecutive points are um, um, above or below, 12 out of 14 consecutive points, uh, two out of three uh, consecutive points. So these principles are all about consecutive points. The first one says that if eight points in a row are above or below the center line, then the process is not in control. So I'm, not going, I'm now going to show you how we study this. We have to look at eight you know, consecutive points. So I go to one of these uh, points. So we start from this point and we look at this point is above, this point is below. So therefore we cannot find eight consecutive points. Then I look at starting from this point, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now these eight are not on one side. I look at from this point, one, two, three, four, five, six. No, they are not on one side. Uh, if I start from here, one, two, three. No, they are not on one side. But if I start from here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Here you are. So the first bullet, bullet is you know showing up and eight points in a row are above or below the center line. In this case, they are above the center line. Therefore, in your paper in the exam, you'll say, although all of the points are within the control limit, but we detect a shift in this X bar, right at the top of the chart, so you know what we are talking about. This is an X bar chart. So in our X bar chart, we are observing a shift. Uh, so it needs our attention and we have to fix the system. So this is how we use the control charts. Um, now, 
is there, do we see any of the other problems? Do we have 10 out of 11 on one side? I don't think so. 12 out of 14. Let me check that. 12 out of 14. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Notice that it should be consecutive points. Nine is also on one side, 10, 11 on this side. If this point was here, then it would be 12 and 14 and the 12 out of 14 would be on one side, but no, this is not violated. Two out of three on uh, outer one third. What is this story of outer one third? Um, so let me make this chart a little bigger for you. Look at this, there is a ribbon here. This is called outer one third. One third of what? One third of this distance. And if two out of the three consecutive points are in that range, then we have a process that is shifted. So look at this, one, two, and three. So two of these three are in that range, therefore we detect the shift. Also one, two, three. This is another shift. One, two, and three. So two out of three are in that range, therefore there is a shift. So it is important for us to detect the ribbon that uh, is that outer one third. And the same thing we have to do here on both sides. This outer ribbon is very important for us. So uh, in our next class, we, what we will do is that we will use the same spreadsheet and we will draw these lines because we have to be able to specifically find those thresholds and check if any of these points are in that uh, tiny ribbon at the, close to the control limits. And if two out of three happens there, then we have a problem. If we want to find that ribbon at the outer one third, so we find the distance between upper control limit and the center line, call it U delta, and then we go from that 43, one third of that U delta down, we get 39. Yeah, so look at this, this, uh, yeah. you have upper control limit and X bar bar, right? Yeah, yeah. That distance, we call it delta. The distance between X bar and X bar bar. No, the, uh, the distance between upper control limit and X bar bar. Oh, okay. And then we call that U delta because we have another delta on this side. So this, this is also another delta. We call this one L delta. But U delta is uh, upper control limit. Maybe I click on it so you see how it is calculated. Let me erase this. Yeah, so first calculate this U delta. And then to find the outer one third, we subtract uh, this 43 minus one third of the U delta. Amir, are you able to go back to the U delta again? I just missed the... Sure. Thank you. Can we see the outer one third again? Maybe, yes. Just make sure that you put dollar sign around B11, but wherever your U delta is, because as we move the formula, we want always to get the U delta from that place. 
How about I write the formula for delta on the, three. on the other side here. So this is delta. There it I don't is. have to show you the formula. You should be able to do the calculation yourself. So this is U delta. And we call this L delta. The, the distance between upper control limit and the center line and lower control limit and the center line. So, Amir, when you refer to like outer one third, that's not like one third from the from the LCL to the UCL, right? That because that would just be just from the formula. It looks like it's just the one third of from the center line to the UCL. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Just want to be clear. Amir. Yes. Um. Why are we dividing this by three? We, we want one third of it. Oh, okay. It's called outer one third. Okay. We want one third of this. Imagine that this is U delta here, um, where I'm writing. Maybe I change it to red. You see, this is from from here to here is one third, and from here to here is outer two third. Okay. If the, if this is the center, we want this outer one third. This region. Okay. So we find this delta and we divide by three, then subtract it from 43 to get 39. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Give me a go ahead signal if you're done. Yes, I am done. Okay. So also we need to do similar thing for the uh, lower delta. Okay. Again, let me... Um, Move this a little bit down. Here we need L delta. And this is, uh, of course, the distance between center line because always center line is bigger than the lower control limit. So this is the L delta. Notice that in this special example, the U delta, L delta are the same, like the distance between upper control limit and lower and center line and center line and lower control limit. Both of them ended up to be the same thing, but it's not always the case. And then here for outer one third, uh, we go lower control limit plus one third of this guy. Notice that um, for the on the upper side, we go from upper control limit and we subtract a little bit. From the lower control limit, we add a little bit to get the, the boundary for outer one third. And remember to put the dollar sign. Then you can copy the formula. And then we need the outer two third. Outer two third, again from the upper control limit, we have to subtract two third of this delta. So two times the delta over three and uh, Remember that we have to put the dollar signs. So you see the one third, and basically we are dividing this distance uh, to three regions. So this is the, maybe I change the color so it becomes more obvious to you. This is the... This is the Amir, can you uh, show me the outer one third? I'm just not getting the right number here. Yes, let, let me just highlight it so you have a better understanding of what's going on. So this is the upper control limit. This is the center line. 
and we want to divide this distance, and the distance is 11 points, to three regions, outer one third and outer two third, and of course this would be the inner This is the inner one third, which we don't have any rule for inner one third, but that we have two rules for outer one third and outer two third. It hangs. Yeah. And then here we want outer two third in the lower side. I don't show you for this one. You have to basically in this location, you have to have 21, 21, but not the values though, using the formula, plus two third of L delta. So you go from here, two third of L delta, one third, and another one third to reach to this point. Okay, so now we have a spreadsheet that has all of the values. We select this, oh, including the X bar. And we insert a chart. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. And now, a number of things we have to do in this chart. Uh, these lines are automatically colored. I want you to make the center line black. So make sure that you click on these until the whole line is selected. And then we go to format and we make the shape black also i want the line to be black offline good okay so this is what we wanted okay so now my center line is black uh, the fourth uh, bullet says that if two out of three are in outer one third then we have a problem so outer one third, this region is the outer one third. This area is outer one third. Of course, we have another outer one third here. And uh, yes, we see that there is a problem here. One, two, three consecutive points. Two of them are in outer one third, therefore, this bullet is violated, is observed. Therefore, we are observing a shift in the process. And this is the X bar chart in which we have a shift. Like the, we see a shift in the average of the uh, output. Uh, so basically, if it's a machine that is producing this, uh, you know, the calibration has uh, gone wrong and the centrality or X bar has shifted we detect a shift. Um, the other bullet says two out of, uh, four out of five in outer two third. Now I will hash the outer two third, look at this, this is outer two third. This region is outer two third. And if we see four out of five in this region between the upper control limit, and two third of the distance. There's another outer two third here. You see this range, this range, this range is outer two third. And if we see a four out of five, let's check. One, notice that this yellow, yellow line doesn't matter anymore. We are focusing on this ribbon. One, two, three, and then here we have four and five. Not only four out of five, but also five out of five are in the outer two-thirds. There is another reason for us that 
uh, this we observing a shift in the centrality. Okay, and uh, you know to keep everything in good shape, we click on this chart. Stop. Yes, we click on the chart and we right click on the chart. We move it to a new sheet and we call it X bar chart. Very good. So this is our X bar chart and sheet uh, two. Let's move it to the left where we have our data. Let's rename it to data. So we have our data and we have our X bar chart. Uh, there are reasons that this process is, uh, we observe a shift and it's getting out of control or the no point is out of control limits. Eight in a row are in the one side of the center line, two out of three are in outer one third and four out of five are in outer two third. So there are three reasons that this uh, X bar chart is out of control. Okay, so we detected that in this uh, system, there was a <clears throat> shift in the centrality. So X bar, the average of each sample is shifting. Now, the other thing that can happen is that sometimes the average is not shifting, but uh, the variation around the average is shifting, like a vibration around the center line. Even if the center line doesn't shift, uh, we don't want too much variation around the center line. So the goal of our chart and our bar that we rely on is that. Um, if you remember, for the uh, X bar chart, we needed R, so we have calculated all of the ranges and the average of the ranges already. The only thing that we have to do, we have to find the upper control limit and the lower control limit for variations of range, and then our life would be easy. Again, for range also we need uh, u delta and l delta delta on the upper side and delta on the lower side um, between upper control limit and lower control now let's find the upper control limit uh, what is the upper control limit for our chart it's a d4 times r very good. So we need D4. Uh, so if we need D4, then you have to go to that table and tell me for row three, what is D4? Upper control limit for our chart is D4 R bar. And the lower control limit for R is D3 R bar. And D4 and D3 come from the same table uh, from which we got A2. So somebody please go to Appendix B and tell us what is D3 and D4 for uh, a sample size of three. It's a zero and 2.574. 2 um, so I have to, for upper control limit, I have to multiply 2.574 multiplied by R bar. And D3, you said is zero, right? Zero multiplied by anything will be zero. Here we are. And now we need the outer one third, outer two third, and on the lower side again, outer 
one third and outer two third. U delta is the distance between upper control limit and the center line. L delta is the distance between center line and the lower control limit. And now outer one third is, we have to go lower than upper control limit by one third of this guy. Good, and the next step is that outer one third on the lower side would be the lower control limit plus one third of this delta. And again, we have to put the dollar signs. Outer two third on the upper side would be upper control limit minus two times delta over three, two third of delta. And again, we need the dollar signs. Okay, I show you the formula. You know, if you have done everything right, when you start from upper control limit, do you see this row of numbers? 28, 22, 16, 11. So very nicely they go down. If you are doing things right, you see that these lines are going down and down and down. Now for outer two third, uh, it is the lower control limit plus two third of the this delta on the lower side and again we make it absolute addressing okay now we can look at the variation notice that r uh, range is a measure of how much variation we have in this sample like 31 42 28 the range of the variations are here so now we can look at how ranges are changing. Are they stable or not? Insert, chart, and now you see why we do all of that labor. The, uh, the U delta and L delta, they are not always the same. In this case, look at this, this is our center line and our center line now is not really at the center of this diagram because this upper delta was much bigger than the lower delta. So now the question is, is R in uh, control or not? Or we see a shift in variations. Now, um, the first rule of the set of bullets says eight points in a row on one side. Okay, so let's call it, I, I write down the way that I expect you to write it in the exam here. So when I'm, uh, how about I, we move it to another page. Okay, so we click on the chart and we move it to a new sheet called R chart. Now, this is our R chart. Now we want to analyze our R chart. Rule one was that uh, eight in a row on one side. Do we see eight in a row on one side of the center line? No. No. Very good. So this is not violated. Then we have 
10 out of 11 consecutive points on one side. Do we see eight, uh, 10 out of 11 on one side? We have to take 11 consecutive points and see 10 of them are on one side. No. No, there is no shift there. And then we have 12 out of 14. The next rule says 12 out of 14 consecutive points on one side of the center line. That is not also violated. Now, next rule says that two out of three in outer one third. Outer one third here is absolutely empty. Outer one third here, absolutely empty. It's very good. Basically, the variation is not a lot at all. Variations are all tiny around the center line. Okay, so there is no points in outer one third. Of course, there is no two out of three points in outer one third. And then the next, the last bullet says that four out of five in outer two third. This is outer two third region. Of course, in total, we have three in outer two third here and only one in outer two third. So four out of five in outer two third. This didn't happen, this didn't happen. So range or R chart is in control and we don't see any shift. So when we look at the variations, basically this, this system, its variation is not, it's not vibrating. It is not too much variation around the center line. It's fine. But when we look at its uh, X bar, the variations of the center line, that's terrible. The same process, we see that there was a shift in the X bar, but there is no shift for R bar. Basically, we realized that we, um, there is a drift in the centrality of the, uh, the output, but the, it's not vibrating or variating too much around the center line. Okay, so um, uh, the, in our next class, we learned two other charts. Like today, we learned our, our chart and the uh, X bar chart. In our next class, we learn two other charts, but because you already know, it would be repetitive for you. So like, imagine that we are practicing similar concept in another scenario, two scenarios, uh, which are when uh, we are counting the number of faults instead of measuring uh, the average or the range for when the data is nominal. Uh, and uh, Basically, we will review this, all of these steps again in our next class for two other charts, and we will finish the statistical process control.